we're going to be discussing the the spate of murders of Asian American people over the last several weeks, and in fact, really uh, going back centuries, but um, uh, most acutely since the pandemic was really publicly identified and falsely linked to China by the previous administration. So we're going to discuss what the issues are, um, particularly for the trans community, with um, a very distinguished guest who has a lot of experience in this area. Pauline Park is a transgender activist who co-founded Queens Pride House, which is a center for LGBTQ communities of Queens and Iban Queer Koreans of New York. Uh, she also co-founded the New York Association for Gender Rights Advocacy, which is the first statewide transgender advocacy organization in New York. And she's also served on the steering committee of the coalition that secured the enactment of the Dignity in All Schools Act by the New York City Council. And um, someone who is no stranger to Out FM, we're pleased to have her back again to um, talk about this very serious situation that uh, really everyone needs to face up to. Thank you, Pauline, for being back on Out of FM. Thank you, Bob and John and Naomi. It's uh, great to be back on Out of FM. All right. Well, um, I was particularly struck by uh, a video I watched of a presentation you gave at a vigil in um, Elmer's Queens on March 21st that was organized by AAPI, that's uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Sisters, um, to honor the Asian Americans who were murdered in the Atlanta massacre. And that was um, nine people uh, shot to death, seven of whom were Asian women. Um, and this was, of course, at a uh, at a series of massage parlors uh, in the Atlantic met uh, Atlanta metro area. Um, and um, our guest, Pauline Park, ad addressed those issues that were raised by the murder from a progressive feminist intersectional perspective. And so I'd like to ask her right now to just actually read that, that speech that you gave at that uh, vigil uh, about a week and a half ago. I'd be happy to, thank you. I would like to thank Carolyn Tran and all those who helped organize this important event. And I will say that I join with you today in anger and sorrow and resolve. Anger at the hatred that took the lives of eight innocent victims of hate, seven, seven of them women and six of them Asian American women in the Atlanta area last week in what is being called the Atlanta massacre. Sorrow for the loss of innocent lives, eight people taken from us for no legitimate reason, eight human beings with hopes and dreams and challenges just like the rest of us, and resolve that we should take this horrific tragedy and turn it into a catalyst for real change in this country. In the first press conference the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office held after the killings, Captain Jay Baker infamously said of the murderer, Aaron Robert Long, that he was, quote, just having a bad day, end of quote. Well, the eight people he murdered had a far worse day that turned out to be the very last day of their lives. And the sheriff's captain who could try to excuse or explain away these murders by trying to cast the murderer in a more sympathetic light was just demonstrating his own white privilege and male privilege. It turns out that, even, that he even posted comments on his own Facebook page that tried to link the coronavirus to China with Trump style rhetoric, the kind of rhetoric that has incited an almost unprecedented wave of violence against Americans of Asian descent since the onset of the pandemic a year ago this month. I say almost unprecedented because those Americans who know the history of Asian immigrants in this country know that there's a long history of violence against Asians and Asian Americans, 
that is only being widely reported in media in the wake of the Atlanta massacre. While African Americans have been routinely subjected to lynching and racial violence, since slave ships brought the first Africans in chains to the North American continent over 400 years ago, immigrants from Asia have also been subjected to racialized violence for well over a century and a half. In fact, the single worst lynching in American history was the lynching of 19 Chinese immigrants by a largely white mob in Los Angeles on the 24th of October, 1871. Why is it that so few Americans, including too few Asian Americans, know this long history of racial violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders? As APIs, we've been mostly left to fend for ourselves, too many of us hoping that we could assimilate as a model minority. But the model minority myth hasn't saved us from discrimination, abuse, harassment, and violence, as last week's events in Georgia have proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. Instead, the model minority myth has only served the interests of the white establishment to pit APIs against other communities of color, when the only way forward is to forge bonds of solidarity with other communities of color. And just as we need to reject the model minority myth, we need to question the notion that more police will protect us. In fact, more policing is not the answer, especially not in a city in which the NYPD have routinely engaged in police brutality against people of color, including APIs and LGBT queer people of color. The NYPD's $6 billion annual budget is larger than that of the national military budgets of many foreign countries. Nor will hate crimes legislation save us. In fact, New York has a state hate crimes law that includes race and ethnicity, but that statute hasn't done anything to prevent this latest wave of hate crimes against us. Instead, we need to bring a progressive feminist intersectional analysis to bear on the current crisis. And as a progressive trans feminist of Korean birth, I would argue that we have to understand that the six Asian immigrant women who were murdered in Atlanta lived and died at the intersection of multiple oppressions of race, gender, sexuality, class, nationality, and immigration status. While their murderer made clear his racial animus in his online rants against China and Asians, we also have to understand that women who work in massage parlors do so on the margins of the sex industry, and this is yet another compelling argument to decriminalize sex work of all kinds. So I would urge members of the New York State Senate and Assembly to support Assemblymember Ron Kim's bill that is supported by the coalition organized by Red Canary Song to decriminalize sex work under state law. Let me conclude by acknowledging that the way forward will be a difficult one, and there is no easy answer to the miasma of hate and violence that we now find ourselves in. I would argue that we must set for ourselves the goal not only of educating law enforcement and the criminal justice system about anti-Asian hate, but of transforming that system, which all too often delivers only criminal injustice to APIs and other people of color, as well as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and queer people, and members of other marginalized groups in this city, the state, and this country. Our goal must be nothing less than to transform society so that racialized, sexualized, and gendered violence against any group becomes inconceivable. Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, Woodside, and Corona are the most diverse neighborhoods in Queens, the most diverse county in the United States. And a demographer recently determined that this is the most demographically diverse spot on planet Earth. Here in Queens, we take pride in our diversity, but we need to make diversity more than just a slogan for politicians to spout in campaign speeches. As we stand here on the Moore Homestead Playground, let's commit to making the city, the state, and the entire country a safe homestead for everyone. And that must involve the radical pursuit of justice for all. Thank you. And thank you. Pauline Park. Um, she was just reading a speech that she delivered 
about 10 days ago on March 22nd at a vigil organized by AAPI Sisters in Elmhurst, Queens um, to, to uh, commemorate those slaughtered in the Atlanta massacre. And Pauline, let's talk a little bit more about this um, historical way, uh, this historical uh, pattern of violence, verbal and physical, that has targeted Asian people since their first immigration from uh, from Asia more than 150 years ago. Just talk about. Um, the kind of institutionalized nature of it. A lot of people, especially in the past year with the murder of George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor and the long list of black people who've been targeted by the police departments have become at least in broad terms, familiar with the institutionalized nature of racism, anti-black racism, but far fewer people understand how that history has proceeded in a different way, but along a parallel track against Asian immigrants. So can you share some of that history with us? Sure. I think it's really important to note that racialized violence and gendered violence as well against Asian immigrants in the US is in fact as old as Asian immigration to the United States. Um, the only thing that makes the Atlanta massacre of March 16th unique and unusual is the national and international media coverage and the sustained media attention to anti-Asian violence that that horrific event has brought. Uh, in every other respect, it's actually shockingly consistent with this long history of violence against APIs in this country. Uh, I would also argue that this history of uh, racialized violence is inextricably entwined with a long history of anti-immigration legislation. Uh, here in the United States, we tend to think of anti-immigration legislation primarily being aimed at the Latinx community. That may be true recently, but the origins of anti-immigration legislation date to uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, and even before that, to the Page Act of 1875, which was the very first law enacted by the US Congress explicitly to limit immigration. In the case of the Page Act, to limit immigration of Chinese women uh, based on the invidious and obviously false assumption that all Chinese women were sex workers or engaged in sex work of some kind. Uh, there's a long history of amendments to the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, but it wasn't until uh, Lyndon Johnson signed the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 into law that Congress abolished the national quota system, which was based on explicit quotas of particular countries that was very much based on a racial hierarchy with the British being at uh, the top and immigration to Southern European countries like Italy restricted severely and immigration from Asian countries uh, virtually entirely restricted. And so we have to take into account that very long history of attempting to exclude Asian immigrants, which really uh, only came to a significant end in 1965. Well, thank you for that history, Pauline. And um, now let's, let's fast forward to today. And um, there was a very interesting op-ed piece in the New York Times um, three days ago uh, titled, How to Protect Massage Workers. It's by Elena Shi, who's a sociologist who studies human trafficking and sex work. And she's also an outreach organizer with Red Canary Song, the, uh, the community group that you mentioned earlier. Um, let me just read a little excerpt and get your comment. Um, she writes, Asian massage parlors have long been a target of law enforcement and anti-trafficking 
organizations who see, quote, illicit massage businesses, unquote, as loci of human trafficking. Nearly all of these organizations have called for increased surveillance and policing of massage businesses, and the result has been hundreds of raids across the country which have terrorized and criminalized massage workers. These systemic forms of violence cannot be divorced from the brutal killings of massage parlor workers in the Atlanta area on March 16th. Countless Asian massage workers in the U.S. are not victims of sex trafficking, and many of them are not sex workers, even if they are profiled as such by police agencies, anti-trafficking organizations, and civilian vigilante groups. To ensure their safety, we should turn instead to the work of grassroots migrant, labor, and sex worker rights organizations that focus on massage worker safety, organizing, and mutual aid. Pauline, uh, your comment. I agree entirely with her on this. I. Uh, will mention that I actually represent Niagara, the New York Association for Gender Rights Advocacy in the broad-based coalition uh, that was uh, formed by Red Canary Song to advance decriminalization legislation in the New York State Legislature. I think that organizations like Red Canary Song uh, should be allowed to take the lead on this. Uh, police, uh, police, more policing will not help the problem. Uh, as Elena Show points out, it will actually only make matters worse. And unfortunately, the NYPD, like many police departments in this country, use the legitimate issue of sex trafficking and human trafficking as a pretext uh, to uh, raid massage parlors, terrorize workers, and effectively drive the problem of human trafficking further underground. The only way actually to address human trafficking, if one's serious about it, is to decriminalize sex work and enable uh, those who might be victims of trafficking to come forward uh, with assurances that they will not be deported uh, for doing so. Um, so I think that what we need to do is rather than expanding the prison industrial complex and relying on the carceral state uh, to try to solve problems that uh, the prison industrial complex itself helped create. We need to come up with progressive alternatives that give agency uh, to women, trans people, and others who are either involved with the sex industry in some fashion or are on the margins, working on the margins of it, or are simply assumed to be sex workers because of their gender identity by the police. Well, and speaking of not uh, further reinforcing the prison industrial complex, uh, you mentioned in your speech, and, and I know on other occasions, the dangers of so-called hate crimes legislation. And um, I, that's, that's often a, a tough argument for people to accept. They, they see that as an unmitigated benefit to oppressed communities, to finally have uh, heightened accountability to people whose crimes against any of our communities are motivated by hatred uh, of that grouping. Um, so lay out for us your concerns about hate crimes legislation. I think that hate crimes legislation is genuine, uh, genuinely and sincerely motivated uh, by a desire to address uh, the problem of hate crimes. On the one hand, it is important to identify crimes such as those that were committed on uh, March 16th in Atlanta as hate crimes, in other words, as part of a larger pattern and not simply isolated incidents of violence. On the other hand, state hate crimes laws, such as the one that we have here in New York, uh, have not actually done anything to reduce hate crimes. Um, New York's law, which is called Executive Law 8374C, which is enacted in 2000, uh, unfortunately only adds additional penalties to the underlying crime. So if it's a class B, C felony, it'll bump it up to a class B. And if it's a class B, it'll bump it up to a class A for additional uh, sentencing. Now, 
against such legislation, I would argue what we need is hate crimes legislation that focuses on information and data collection so that we can identify victims of hate crimes based on specific categories. And in fact, the one part of the Matthew Bird, uh, of the Matthew Shepard James Bird Hate Crimes Prevention Act enacted by Congress in 2009, which I think is positive, along with uh, the enhanced penalties provisions, which I think are uh, overwhelmingly negative, is the provision that uh, requires the FBI to track statistics on hate crimes based on gender and gender identity, as well as other uh, categories, uh, modifying the 1990 Hate Crime Statistics Act. So I think uh, empowering federal and state and local agencies to track and monitor the commission of hate crimes can be a positive thing. Uh, but we have to guard against any attempt to expand punitive hate crimes laws that include enhanced penalties provision. And we've already seen um, outcry from more conservative elements of the Asian American community calling for increased punishment and punitive uh, responses and increased policing in response to the wave of anti-Asian hate crimes here in the city and the state. And so I think we can make the distinction between identification of hate crimes, data collection, collaboration with community-based organizations versus carceral attempts to add further punishment to existing statute law. All right, well, um, Pauline Park, in the remaining three minutes we have, um, I just wanna take advantage of your presence here to tap into your expertise uh, as, a, as a, one of the national leaders of the transgender rights movement um, about this wave of legislation um, that is, is uh, starting to pass in Republican controlled states that um, essentially bans uh, girls and young women from participating in organized sports in their schools. Um, and the New York Times actually ran an article about this yesterday that described it as, quote, a culture clash that seems to have come out of nowhere. Um, and there's 20 other states that have bills uh, in wa waiting to be adopted as well. So. Um, in, in the remaining two minutes or so, give us your analysis of what's behind these bills and what why are they so wrongheaded when they pretend to um, quote unquote, promote fairness in women's sports and save women's sports and other sort of rhetoric. That, well, yes, there's yeah, no there's no credible science behind it. There's no legitimate justification for this wave of legislation. The religious right, has lost the battle, the war over same-sex marriage. And so they've decided to attack the transgender community and focus on the most vulnerable elements of that community, which are trans youth, um, using a false flag of trying to protect uh, conventionally gendered or cisgendered youth from unfair competition. In fact, uh, it's just a ruse. It's an attempt to divide uh, LGBT activists from women, second wave feminists, others who might think there's some legitimate purpose behind this legislation, which there isn't. So we have to resist this legislation and defeat it because it is pernicious. It is based purely on transphobia and political opportunism. And it's just the latest uh, wedge issue that uh, the religious right is trying to use uh, via the Republican party uh, to demonize and criminalize transgender identity. Well, we're gonna have to leave it there, but um, uh, 
This is an important set of issues that we're going to continue covering here on Out of Fem. I want to thank our guest, Pauline Park, a nationally known transgender activist and uh, has many achievements to her name, um, and who's a Korean American uh, who's been particularly or, uh, mobilized against the recent wave of anti-Asian violence in the city and this country. Thank, and, thanks, Bob. Uh, feel yeah. free to read my speech on pawingpark.com. Follow me at Pawing Park on Twitter uh, or on Facebook. Very good. Okay, and could, could you stick around for a minute to give us, uh, uh, give our listeners uh, an explanation of why they need to support WBAI and become a member? Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay, um, if you want to take the lead and we'll follow you. Okay, well, uh, WBAI is one of the few non-corporate media outlets in the city. It is a vital link between the media world and uh, the activist community that it covers, including the LGBTQ community, communities of color. Uh, Out FM is uh, a wonderful program that I've appeared on several times uh, with uh, John and Naomi. And it is a vital resource uh, to everyone in the city uh, and really across the country. And so I would urge people uh, to join as members or to renew their membership and uh, support WBAI as a station so that wonderful programs like Out FM can continue to broadcast, can broadcast interviews with activists who are doing important progressive radical activism on the ground, whether LGBT activism, Palestine solidarity work, um, anti-police brutality, police violence work, uh, anti prison industrial complex work, work on the international level involving uh, challenging US foreign policy when, it get, uh, when it's wrong. These are all compelling reasons to support WBAI as a station uh, so that out of them and other wonderful programs like it can continue to broadcast. 